Remember, we opened up talking about that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, I'm here to tell you that verse 20 says that, uh, verse 21 says that he has seated my Christ at his right hand in the heavenlies far above all principality and authority and power and dominion. So even the principalities and the spiritual wickedness that's after your life, that's after your children, that's after your job, that's after your well-being, well, my Jesus is seated, in a, seated at a higher place of authority, and he surpasses it with his greatness of power. All we have to do is tap in. Amen? Hallelujah. I just I got to grab something. Something was just dropped to me, and I got to grab it real quick before I, before, I, before I lose it. Amen? Hold on one second. See, Ephesians 2, 6. Now we're talking about God, Jesus, being seated at the right hand of the Father, right? And you're like, well, well, pastor, that's Jesus. That's not me. No, Ephesians 2, verse 4. We'll start with verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you're not just, oh my God, I feel a something going on on the inside. See, you're not just here on this earth fighting the principalities. You are seated in heaven with Jesus at the place of authority. Come on, give God some praise. How many are um, understand that there is a devil loose? Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Because a lot of people don't want to believe it, no matter how real it is. You know, and I, and I shared briefly on Wednesday that I might come on this topic, and I kind of shared quickly yesterday at the food pantry with this topic. But since the beginning of this outbreak pandemic, of this COVID-19, also known as the coronavirus, you've heard our president call it an invisible enemy, that we're fighting an invisible enemy, which is 100% true. Can you walk up to anybody and look at them and go, oh, you got the COVID? Can you see when they breathe the virus coming out of their mouth that you like smoke? No, you can't see it. That's why they're incorporating these social distancings, because even when people don't have symptoms, they could be carrying it and you could contract it. That's normal with a lot of sicknesses. There, some people can be, you know, asymptomatic, meaning they have all this. They have the virus, but they don't show the symptoms. So they're just carriers and they pass it on. Well, we also have that in our walks with God. There is an invisible enemy that's after your life. There's an invisible enemy that's after your children. There's an invisible enemy that's after your household. There's an invisible enemy that's after your job, after your finances, after your happiness, after your well-being. And I'm here to tell you, I'm going to call him out by name. His name is the devil. Amen. He is the principality of this earth that is working right now in full effect to hurt you, to seek, to kill, and to destroy you. Believers and non-believers, amen? And it's our job to recognize that we are at war with a spiritual enemy that's invisible, amen? And he's out to hurt you, amen? And he's operating all through this pandemic. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Now, we kind of briefly touched on this on two Wednesdays ago when we talked about the helmet of salvation. 
See, you've got to have your mind set and focused on Jesus. You got to have your mind set and focused on the fact that you are saved, that you are made whole, protected and delivered by God Almighty. Amen. And when you have Ephesians 6, 10, you can stand and we'll read the word together. If you're online or on the app, you don't have to stand. But if you want to, we stand in recognition of God's holy word. Amen. We're not standing because the pastor told me to. We're standing because the word of God deserves reverence. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. And for those watching Facebook Live, Minister Lopez is taking a picture of it for you so you can read it along. Amen. Hallelujah. And starting next week on our stream, you'll be able to watch the video, the, the scriptures on the same way we've all done worship. You'll be able to have the scriptures as we read them too. Amen. But let's read, church. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may resist, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, here's Paul. After the book of Ephesians is a book of all kinds of instructions. And there was a gentleman, a pastor, prophet by the name of Kenneth Hagin Sr. He took this book of Ephesians. From the big chapter one all the way to the end and wrote a book called the believer's authority. See here you've got this book of Ephesians is teaching us about the authority that we have in Christ. And notice he's ending it saying finally my brethren be strong in the Lord. Notice it doesn't say be strong in yourself. Don't be, it doesn't, doesn't even say be strong in faith. He says be strong in the Lord. See, there's going to be times in your life where all you're going to have is the Lord Jesus. Amen. You're going to run out of every every form of emotional, mental, physical strength that you possess. And the only strength you're going to have left is the strength and the mighty power of the Lord. And he's saying, be be strong and in power of his might. Then he goes on to say that put on the armor that's been provided. See, God has provided armor for the believer. Amen. He's provided one offensive weapon, which is the word of God, which is a sword of the spirit. And the rest are defensive. And remember, we spoke about the helmet of salvation. I'm not going to get into the armor today, but it may be something that we break down over the next few weeks. But the first thing you've got to after you have all the other armor on, you've got to you've got to have the helmet on. You've got to have the helmet of salvation that says you are saved and made whole and you're one of Jesus's. Because that devil's going to come in and he's going to attack every area he can to try to get you to not believe that. He's going to attack every area he can to get you to give up on God, to give up on life, to just stop believing. And I'm here to tell you today that you can't do that. You have to be strong in the Lord. Why do you think there's so many scriptures like more, weeping may endure the night, but joy comes in the morning. There is not a single thing that says being a Christian is ever going to be easy. You're going to go through stuff. We're going to go through stuff. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, at the, uh, against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I could guarantee you, If there was a way to measure the amount of spiritual wickedness in high places throughout the times, I will tell you, as we're talking about the coronavirus peaking, that is peaking right now. Spiritual wickedness is running rampant through this world. It's running rampant through this nation. And it's up to time for us as believers to stand strong in the Lord and realize and recognize that we are fighting an invisible enemy, but it can be defeated by belief and strength of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Amen. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you realize? See, Pastor, how is that possible that we can have all these attacks? Because let me tell you something. When the Lord kicked out 
devil from heaven, he took one-third of heaven's population with him. He has a legion. He has an army. He has minions that are out doing his work for him because he can't be in one place like our God all the time. He can't be everywhere all the time. He is limited, but he has an army. Some of us have more than one assigned to us. He's got, he's got, I guarantee you, each and every one of you believers in Christ, you have demons assigned to mess up your life. I guarantee it. I don't care, I don't care how, uh, how uh, uh, the more anointed you are, I believe the more demons get it put on you, amen? The more work you're doing for the kingdom, uh, some people think, oh, I'm just going to give up working for God. No, that's not the way to go. The way to go is to stand strong in the Lord and build up more of a fence around you, amen? But the enemy's going to come. In Isaiah, it says when an enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. It never says anywhere that believing in Christ exempts you from the enemy coming in. Matter of fact, I think it opens up the door for him to come after you even more. Because first off, you're a traitor to him. Because before Christ, you're his. I want to tell you the truth. Before, hey, if you're watching me online right now and you're not saved and you're not believing in Christ, then you're serving the devil. I'm going to tell you right now, live on Facebook, which will probably stop broadcasting me now, but that's okay. We got an app and they don't censor it. I'm telling you right now, if you're not saved, you're serving and you're part of the enemy's kingdom of darkness. Come on, give him praise. Oh, the hate mail going to come now. But praise God for hate mail. Because if you're doing that, you're just, trying, you're just being part of his kingdom to try to bring me down. Amen. We won't stand for the enemy anywhere. Amen. See, 1 Peter 5, 8. Some people go, wow, Pastor, you were that's, that's the truth. That's the truth. There's too many preachers behind pulpits worrying about making your ears feel good. Making, oh, 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 how many people did I get watching me? Uh, how many thumbs? Who cares how many likes you got? The only like you need to care about is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Come on, give him praise. Get the favor of the Trinity in your life. Humble yourselves. Get saved. Because if you're not saved, when trouble comes, you got nowhere to go. 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sensible and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. Back in the book of Job, you hear God ask Satan, Well, wait a minute. If Satan got kicked out, what's he doing talking to God? So God says, hey, what are you doing? Satan says, I'm just roaming around to and fro looking to whom I can devour. Backs this scripture up. And he says, have you, have you considered my trusted servant, Job? Satan says, well, <laughs> you've got such a hedge of protection around him, I can't touch him. So you would think God would be like, yeah, that's right. That's my boy. God said, okay, I'm going to lower the hedge. Stop it in Jesus' name. He said, I'm going to lower the hedge. Just don't kill him. Just don't hurt his body. Just don't kill him. See, even if you're God's best servant, the enemy is going to try you. But God, in his wisdom, believes in you and knows you know the truth. And you will come out on the other side. Because remember, we talked about Peter. Jesus told him that the devil was going to sift him as wheat. But at sifting, what it did was it separated what wasn't of God from Peter. And when he was done sifting, he was nothing but full of God and a preacher. And he was so full of God when he died, they crucified. They weren't crucifying him. And he said, no, 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 don't crucify me right side up. I'm not worth it. Crucify me upside down. That's, he was so filled with the Holy Ghost, he would walk past people and his shadow would heal him. People would be sitting there all filled with the devil. He'd walk by in his shadow. Be like, bam, they'd be the devil cast right out of them. You see, spiritual wickedness in high places existed and it still exists. 
But the devil's in full effect, and he's loose. So you got to be aware. It says to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. Why do you think you have to put hedges of protection and garrisons of angels around your house? Why do you think you've got to apply the blood of Jesus? That's not just religious rigmarole we go through. That's scriptural, and we have to do it to protect our family. When your children are going out in the world, you need to pray for their protection. Because now they still have free will and their free mind. But the Bible says if you train them up in the right way, they won't depart depart far. What? Pastor White, that's saying your children may depart. But if you've done your job, they will return. Amen. You see, be sensible, be vigilant. Right now, the country is saying, be sensible, be vigilant. Social distance. Keep six feet from everybody. I have... Never seen so many people with masks on in my life. I go to Walmart, and, they all, and I, I'm walking around without one. And looking around, everybody's like got their masks on. I feel like I'm in some kind of surgical ward or something. Amen? But it's, that's okay. Social distancing has obviously s- curved this pandemic out. And I'm not putting social distancing down. And I'm not putting anybody down who wears a mask. I, that's, that's your choice, your, your desire. They're just too uncomfortable for me. And I just, and I... Blood of Jesus has got me. Amen. When we're at our office, we do to protect, you know, for patients and for their comfort and to protect them. But when I'm out in public, I'm not putting on a mask. I just only the pantry because we have to, too, there. But otherwise, that's it. I'm not riding in my car with a mask on. But what I'm here to say is we need to also, because he says be sensible and vigilant, we need to have some social distancing in the spirit. Bible says not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It says stand firm in the liberty. Galatians 5 verse 1. Then the second verse says, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage again to slavery. Talking about sin. You see, a lot of us want to be Christian, but we want social distance from some sins in our life. You realize you just opened up a pathway for the en- that invisible enemy to creep right in. See, that invisible enemy is around. He is everywhere, and he's looking for any access to any household, to any church, to any business that he can uh, get in and start sowing his seeds of deception, his illusions, and his lies. He is the father of lies. But not only that, he, 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 now, I am not telling you that he's not powerful. But I'm not telling you that he's more powerful than my Jesus and the Jesus that lives inside of you. My job today is to make you aware that there is a spiritual warfare going on for your life, for your household, for your finances. And it is being led by an army of invisible foes that you cannot see. They're not just going to walk up and go, hey. Mr. So-and-so, devil sent me to mess with you. They're not going to do that. How are they going to come? They're going to come get in your kid's life when they're at school. And you can't be at school with them. And, and, and the way to teach some of the things they're teaching in school are leaning away from the Bible. And they're teaching things that are against not even part of the Bible. And history, they're, they're picking and choosing what they want to add. Even the, the dictionaries. I have old dictionaries by Webster. I don't want the Webster's New World Dictionary. Look at the difference in the, in the, the one written in the 1800s to the one that just gets published next year or last year. They're going to be watered-down versions that are more worldly and user-friendly. You see, that's all work of the enemy. The enemy is trying to cut, close God, cut God out of everything that he created. He's trying. He will be defeated, but he is giving it a good 13th round. He has got us. He's got the world in the ring, and he's trying to do some combinations, some uppercuts, some body jabs, because he wants to get a knockout punch. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to call him out. I'm here to say he will not win. The inevitable enemy will be defeated. How? By the kingdom of God, by the sword of the spirit, by the church that rises is up. It says no more. No more. No more. Come on. I would be a liar 
I would be one of the preachers that R.W. Shambach had a dream about. Yeah, I don't know if you know who R.W. Shambach is, but he's a revivalist. He's from, a lo- from years ago. And he had a dream. He said he dreamed and he went to hell. And he was walking in hell on a corridor like you would see in the movies, you know, of brimstone and fire all shooting up around his ankles. And he said hands were grabbing up out of him from the fire going, why didn't the preachers tell me the truth? Why didn't the preachers tell me the truth? There's a lot of preachers that are lying to you. There is a devil loose and he's out to get you. He, the spiritual wickedness in high places, spirit of alcoholism, the spirit of addiction, the spirit of all these different spirits that come after you, and the world accepts it. And the world says, well, everybody has rights. Listen, if, the, if, if your rights aren't found in the Bible, that's, that, this, is, this is it. This is the rap right here, the word of God. You have weapons at your warfare to be used. You've got The helmet of salvation. Remember, we talked about the belt of truth. The belt covers your reproductive loin. loin. We're supposed to be reproducing truth in our lives, in our own lives, in our households, in our community. And that truth gets sown in you so that at the time of need, the truth will rise up. And you'll be able to wield the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and say, devil, get back in the name of Jesus. My, I'm not sick because my word of God says that I'm healed by his stripes. I'm not broke because I'm the head, I'm the head, and I'm not the tail. And Jehovah Jireh is my provider. You won't have my children because they're covered in the blood of Jesus. You won't have my finances because I'm a tither. Come on, give him praise. See, if, now, you're like, Pastor, you're really on this devil. Yeah, he's got me a little pissed off this morning. I can say that in church. I didn't cuss. Oh, he's got me ticked. Man, I, I'm pissed at that devil right now. If you're watching and you're worshiping him, get saved. Facebook going to hate me today. I'll probably get a letter straight from the owner. Amen. Mark, whatever, Zuckerberg. Watch, he's, he's another one. Anyway, see, you're like, Pastor, but you're talking about this prince of the palatines. Look what Ephesians 2 1 says. And this talking about that he is Jesus, and he made, has made you alive who were once dead in trespasses and sin. So that's where I'm talking about. Galatians 5 1 says, don't get entangled again to the yoke of bondage and bondage of slavery because that's sin. Sin keeps you bound. So why would you want to be free? And then go back into the sin. Then he says in Ephesians 2, in which once you walked according to the course of this world. Now remember also in Romans 12, it says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, there's got to be a renewing that takes place. When you get saved, you can't just get saved and nothing changes. When you get truly saved, stuff's supposed to start to change. You're supposed to have a desire for the word of God. You're supposed to have a desire for the things of God. And the more desire you get, you're going to bury the word in you and you're going to be able to use it and stop walking according to the world see the world is walking its way straight to hell the world and its views are walking and anybody who wants to follow it are walking their way straight to hell it says in which once you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air who do you think they're talking about right there who is paul referring to he's referring to the devil he has the prince of of the power of the air. He is the prince of darkness. He is the prince that is ruling and running rampant in this world right now. And the only ones that can have power over him are the ones that call on the name of Christ. The ones that apply the blood of Jesus. Amen. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Got a lot of children. And I'm not just talking children by age. I'm talking children of the father of lies that are considered to be the children of disobedience. 
I'm, I'm not going to list all, this, all the things of the children are doing, but you look around and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a lot of disobedience towards the word of God in the world that we live in, and it's orchestrated by the, follow, the father of lies, and he's working through the children of disobedience. In verse 3 it says, And among whom you also had our way of life in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. See, the flesh is, I want this. There's a lot of flesh in the world. A lot of people are, are, are doing the social distancing, but they're not happy because they can't do things that they want. Sometimes it's not the things that you need. It's the things that you want that get you all frustrated. Someone tells you you can't have something, well, I'm out, I'm out, I'm leaving, because I want that, and you don't know what's best for me. That's how this world is operating right now. Like, you know, I would, one of the last things I would ever want to be today, and never had any desire to do it, is to be a government official trying to lead this country or a state or even a county or a city or a town, because one day they love you, then... And then you want to do something, oh, they don't want it. Next year, you don't know what you're talking about. You're an enemy. You're, you're the worst. Then the next day, you co- then you start, oh, you hand them money. Oh, I love you. You're the best. Then you tell them, you know, hey, well, I got to restrict this. Oh, you're horrible. Uh, and, and the way the world is running, if you're, the world needs Christian leaders. Right now, the, there's the Christian leaders are at a minimal. But now, the enemy... There's, and, I, and there's good news in this, but the enemy, if you, if you read 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, it says, but also if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those being lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn on them. See, the enemy is a masterpiece creator of deception and illusion and he paints pictures he'll take a picture in a portrait of your life and he'll paint it in a way what he wants you to think what he wants you to believe the path he wants you to run and if you're not paying attention he will blind you especially it says here unbelieving ones that's the ones he's really after He's after our families who are believers. He wants to stunt the growth. If you have a a child that is saved or trying to serve God, he wants to try to nip that in the bud so that they can't tell others their age. So you got to be careful. He's blinding the world right now. He's blind. I mean, look at this. He has blinded even government officials and police departments that would have the audacity to show up on a church property and barricade it and ticket people who come on a church property to have a drive through service. They weren't even coming to get in a building. They were going to stay in their own cars, but they were coming together for corporate worship, which by the, in, the, in our Constitution is allowed, amen? But here they come along and they're like, oh, no, no, so it's you guys. It's all because of the Antichrist spirit that's flowing through this country right now. You look, Facebook is starting to... C- create starting to first off you look i gotta find the post i'll send everybody facebook is monitoring all your activity on and off of facebook on and off of facebook there's a way to follow it you will find when you go to this link on the end of facebook under the settings that they've been following things that you've been doing that you didn't even do on facebook but you did it through your phone they're, 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 you know, they're doing the one thing which is fully okay. They're muting certain parts of your services because you're using music that's, not, that's got copyright infringements, supposedly. So how are they able to do that if they're not monitoring and listening to everything you're putting out there? That's the work of the enemy. You watch. You watch slowly. The more stuff that's Christ-related, Facebook's going to stop publishing it for you. You watch. I'm calling it right now. See, the enemy is doing his last bit to whatever he's going to do to try to silence the church. But I'm here to tell you, the church can't be silenced by the invisible enemy. The believer can't be put down 
by the invisible enemy. But that does not mean he's not going to try. So now you'll be like, Pastor, oh, my God, I'm so depressed. The invisible enemy's after me. How am I going to win? How am I going to win? Oh, my God. Listen, good news. In the verse of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul had already said that, you know, because of your faith, uh, here, um, I, I pray earnestly for you. And then verse 18, he says, that, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. In other words, that your eyes would be opened. You, under, you would start to understand what I'm going to, all the things he's going to teach in this, but also that you just understand who and what you are in Christ Jesus, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, you have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. You have riches in the kingdom of God. Remember, we talked about the helmet of salvation. When you have the helmet of salvation, that brings the awareness and the enlightenment of all the things that you have access to in the kingdom of God. You realize that when the enemy comes after you in one way, well, wait a minute. No, no, I got this weapon I can use. I got this tactic I can use because I got this scripture that comes against that thing that that devil's trying to tell me because you got the helmet on. You're being sober. You're being vigilant. You're being clear-minded and you're thinking straight because you got the helmet on. Take that helmet off and you're going to make a lot of mistakes and the enemy he knows how to capitalize on them i remember way back in 1995 i was talking to a a a man and he was a very wise man and we were talking about the enemy and he told me he said well my idea of the enemy is this he said he's the best poker player you will ever play in your life and he always has a hidden card And he knows when to play the right card at the right time. See, a lot of us are like, like some people are impulse shoppers. They see something, you got to buy it. Some of us react, we're reactive-based people. The enemy's not like that. Enemy can hang in the cut in the shadows of your life for three, four, five years. Wait for that one golden opportunity. And that's when he says, all right, forces of hell, go, bam. And the attack comes, and then the attack gets in. See, our job is to try to prevent the attacks from coming by serving Jesus, by trusting Jesus, and knowing that we have this verse 19 hope. It says, and what is the surpassing? Other versions say, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us? So you got to understand that no matter what is coming after you, God has a surpassing greatness of power to overcome it. Notice it doesn't say a sometimes power. It says a surpassing greatness of his power. What does it surpass? Surpass means to overtake or to overcome. If you have something that surpasses, it wins. Amen? Greatness of his power towards us, the ones believing according to the working of his mighty strength. His talking about God, talking, and then it goes on, which he worked in Christ in raising him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies. Now, the reason I put this in here is for this verse. Far above all principality and authority and power and dominion and every name being named, not only in this world and also in the coming age. Because remember, we opened up talking about that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, I'm here to tell you that verse 20 says that, uh, verse 21 says that he has seated my Christ at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and authority and power and dominion. So even the principalities and the spiritual wickedness that's after your life, that's after your children, that's after your job, that's after your well-being, well, my Jesus is seated at a, seated at a higher place of authority, and he surpasses it with his greatness of power. All we have to do is tap in. Amen? Hallelujah. I just, I got to grab something. Something was just dropped to me, and I got to grab it real quick before I, before, I, before I lose it. Amen? Hold on one second. See, Ephesians 2, 6. Now, we're talking about God, Jesus, being seated at the right hand of the Father, right? And you're like, well, well Pastor, that's Jesus. That's not me. No, 
Ephesians 2, verse 4. We'll start with verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you're not just, oh, my God, I feel a something going on on the inside. See, you're not just here on this earth fighting the principalities. You are seated in heaven with Jesus at the place of authority. Come on, give God some praise. Because remember, Ephesians 1.22 says he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. See, you are part of him. You are part of his body. He is the head. You are the body. And that devil is under your feet. You got to put him there. You can't turn your back on him. You got to be facing him at all times. Run towards the battle. Don't run from the battle. Amen. Face that invisible army with the power and the surpassing greatness of the power of the Lord God Almighty. Practice your social distancing from sin. Spirit of God will tell you what sin is. Sin is one way the Spirit of God will tell you what sin is. Is that thing will come up on the inside of you going, I wonder if I should be doing this. What would God think about this? And when you choose to willfully sin, you have opened up an avenue that the enemy will try to come in. And you need to close that avenue. But you can also be someone like Job, doing your best for the kingdom of God. And God may allow you to be tried, but God knows in the end you will be the warrior he created you to be. You will be the victorious <laughs> believer and Christian. People sitting in this room, you may be, people watching online, you may be the, per the next person that God uses to raise up, raise you up, and get your whole community and city saved and, you, and raise you up and use you to be someone that he's going to use in this end time. There are people right now that aren't saved today that might get saved today, and don't be surprised if they start leading nations to God. Amen? So don't be scared of the invisible enemy. Be prepared, face him, and fight him in the spiritual realm. Amen? Fight him in the spiritual realm. Your flesh will not be able to win this battle. No matter how hard you try, no matter how hard, and, that, and that's the thing. You know, the Bible says in, in John that the true believers, the, the worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. See, sometimes even with worship, if you're truthfully not worshiping him and you're just going through the motions, it's just an act. When you're giving people encouraging words, do it with the anointing and the love of God so they're real truthful, encouraging words. Even in your time of struggle, and this is hard to do, and as pastors it happens more than it probably does with other people's lives, but even in the middle of your own storms, when someone's reaching out to you for help, you need to be able to put that down for a minute and say, okay, I'm going through something right now. Give me a couple minutes. I'll be back with you. Come give them the attention and the encouragement they need and then go back into your trouble. And, but let me tell you something that happens is when you do that, you find that when you go back to your trouble, it's not as bad. And you feel the encouragement of the Lord because whether you want to believe it or not, you just did his work. Amen? You don't have to be a preacher to do the work of God. Amen? So be encouraged. The invisible enemy cannot win. Amen? Hallelujah. World Harvest Worship Center. Reaching our world. One life. One city. One nation. At a time.